Thank you, Gideon, for that very generous introduction. And uh, thank you all for coming tonight, for sharing this Lenten service together. Um, don't be frightened by him reading all those verses. Uh, we're not going to be here until tomorrow. Um, I just want I got a little nervous myself when you were reading through those. But I am honored to be here this evening and to share with a different congregation. And I, I want to begin by commending your pastor, Pastor Craig, for coming up with this idea of having some other men from the community, from around the city, be part of this series. Because one thing I've learned in the 40 years that I've been part of Northway's leadership is our people as churches love to be together. I mean, we love to serve together. We love to, to uh, do outreach together. We love to have a prayer march or a prayer gathering together. We love to do that. Pastors are often too busy, but the people love to do it. And so thank you for having us. And Craig, thank you for having the vision to do this. And I celebrate with you because I know God's going to honor you and bless you for your faith. And one last thing that this does for us, I think it shows unity. That you have someone from another church that many of you don't know, um, and other men from other churches, and it shows that it just it demonstrates unity at a time that I believe in our country is desperately needed. The church of Jesus needs to show that we are one in unity, in spite of the flood of darkness that's all around us, the church needs to lift up the light and shine brightly together. So, my, my text for this evening is, as um, Gideon read and Craig prayed, the Psalm 139. And we'll be having portions of that scripture up as I go through it. And it is a psalm of David when he revealed the impact of the greatness of God on his own identity. See, we were, at times we're drawn to Jesus because of our struggle with sin. And it's very real. And I thought that John Guest did a marvelous job last week talking about that and talking about how much we are prone to sin and how graciously God covers our sin. But other times people are hung up on well why, why God? I don't understand. I mean why do I need him? And we need something of a revelation of the greatness of God. And that's what we see in this psalm. We see more about God than most of us have ever really taken time to comprehend. In fact, I believe we need both of these perspectives. We need to be aware of our sin and God's desire to cover our sin, but we also need to know how great God is, to grasp how wide and deep and high and long is the love of Christ, to know the, this love which is greater than knowledge, that we might be filled with the fullness of the measure of Christ according to Ephesians 3, 18 and 19. Two weeks ago, Carol and I spent a week in Florida with our oldest son, David, and his wife and four children, ages 10, and 7, and two four-year-old twins. It was our second day there, and we went over to the Gulf Beach. It was just a three-minute car hop over to the beach to watch the sunset. And it was a beautiful moment. It was one of those nights. It was just clear, a few little puffy clouds here and there. And uh, here's a picture of our, the family. You see them hanging out there on the beach, um, waiting for the sun to set. And it was just one of those magical moments. Um, when the sun did go below the horizon, I've never had this experience before. Many of you probably have. But everyone on the beach clapped. I mean, I've had people clap when planes almost crashed and then they landed and things like that, but I, they all clap. And um, the, 
the four-year-old twins weren't really aware of anything. They just kept jumping around and looking for clams and things like that. And the seven-year-old Nina came and she said, well, you know, I thought it would make some sizzle when it hit the water. <laughs> you know, it's a seven-year-old. That's how they see things. It didn't make any sound. It didn't, didn't go up. <laughs> and the 10-year-old didn't say anything. Now, this 10-year-old is, uh, and this is not just a grandparent, you know, flapping my wings, but she is, she's precocious. She reads a ton of things at her age. And, um, you know, she's, she's always asking questions. She's immensely curious, and she loves to learn. And so when we were walking away, um, she hadn't said anything, and she, she bent down, and she picked up two handfuls of sand. And that was a moment that I seized upon, because I realized, well, wait a second. I said, Ellie, can I tell you something about the sand that you have in your hands? And she said, sure. And I said, just let them open up a little bit. And she did, and said, do you know that scientists, specifically astronomers, those who have studied this their whole lives, tell us that there are more stars in the heavens than grains of sand on all the beaches of the entire world. And she reached down again and picked up it. And she said, what? And I repeated that statement. And she, in classic 10-year-old style, said, wow, like, I can't even put my mind around that. <laughs> I can't get my head around it. I, I don't understand it. And then she went, and that, by the way, started a conversation about the things that she couldn't wrap her head around. Like, how could not have a beginning and an end? And things I wasn't prepared to answer, I'd have to call someone else. But, but the fact, you see, and by the way, on, on the grains of sand thing, I, I was just preparing yesterday. I thought at least one person here, maybe more than that, is going to doubt what I just said. So I, I went ahead and did what you're going to plan to do, which is Google it, and say, Hi, how is this really possible? <clears throat> and it turns out that I was a little off. Because the, what I quoted to Ellie was from 2013. The latest stats are that there are 70 septillion stars in the known universe. We can't see the end of it. In the universe that we know, there's 70 septillion stars. Um, look at that number. Now that's 70 with 24 zeros after it. That's slightly more than Jeff Bezos is worth, but it's something. <laughs> but 70 septillion stars. I'll simplify it. It comes down to there are 10,000 stars for each grain of sand. Now, I would admit to you, this, I'm not just spouting some facts and figures, because I think it's important that this sinks in. Don't turn there yet, but let's listen to Psalm, uh, verse 6 of Psalm 139. David said, this is just too wonderful and deep and incomprehensible. And Carol asked me, well, why do you think God did this? Why did he do something this this, this unimaginable, this large. And it came to me, and I don't know, no one no really knows, but maybe he was giving us a, a specific physical metaphor for all the people that say, well, if I can't see it, I don't believe it. He's saying, all right, well, let me show you. Let me show you. Look up in the heavens. And tell me the stars that you see. And how did they get there? And why is there order there? And why is it unscientific to believe that? And why is it all really like great if we had a big bang? But still no one can give you where the first cause was. Anyhow, it just I think God was basically giving us a break and saying, look, just in case you're wondering about the things that you can't see, like my character, like the things we're going to talk about here for the next few minutes, here's something you can see. Every night, uh, maybe not tonight, but every night that the sky is clear, you can look up and you'll see about 
get this, 6,000 stars, less than one grain of sand's worth. That's, I mean, that's how great God is. And by the way, that's also a measure of his love for us. And that's what I loved about the worship tonight. It talked about his holiness, but he's still not finished with me yet. Amen? So wonderful to know that. So we're going to talk real briefly, and I promise you we're just going to skim the ways of this. And perhaps you'll have time in your quiet time this week to, to go a little deeper. We're going to look at three stanzas of the psalm. The first one, which reveals his omniscience, which is the fact that God knows everything. And then we're going to look at his omnipresence, which means God is everywhere. And then we'll look finally at his omnipotence, which means he can do anything. So as we look at this, just consider this is all a measure of the possibility of his love for you and for me in a personal way. Let's talk about omniscience, Psalm 139, 1 through 6. Verse 1 says, you know everything there is to know about me. David is in, he's in wonderment about it. You know everything there is to know about me. Now, friends, listen. Google and Facebook and Amazon know a lot about you. I mean, it's a scary lot, to be honest. But they don't know everything. Pastor Craig was praying that. I, it just just to, to have someone say that. God knows everything. He knows what we're wrestling with. He knows what we're about to think and say. He knows he had, there's no secrets with God, right? You can say, I'm not going to tell my spouse about that. But God already knows about it, so there's nothing confidential that God doesn't say, well, I'm not going to don't give me any details. You know, I don't need to know more. He knows everything. Verse 3. You read my heart like an open book. And every word I'm about to speak, even before I start a sentence. Um, question. I need your response on this. Have you ever said something... And while it was coming out of your mouth, you wish you hadn't said it and could put it back in? Yeah. <laughs> a lot of affirmation there. It's called being in that moment of really feeling awkward. And I can guarantee that every man of steel that's going to stand up here has done something as dumb as I did a number of years ago, thankfully. Uh, when I bumped into a couple that came to our church and was grateful that I remembered their name, it had been over a year since I'd seen them, I thought, something like that. And they were a young couple, married couple. And the wife was just a little thicker here, yeah. And um, just showing a little bit. And I said, oh, I didn't know you were pregnant. She said, no, I'm not. You want to know there are a few things you cannot recover from in life? That's one of them. That's, that's when you just would like to sink down into the concrete and just disappear, you know, do some, something like that. Um, I've never done that again. <laughs> I'm still carrying the wounds of saying it and trying to recover from it. Um, and I said, Lord, you knew I was going to say that. Why didn't you stop me? And he said, I tried but you weren't listening. Lord, you look into my future and you prepare the way. And that's awesome. You see, if you willingly place every upcoming event or decision, change or challenge before the Lord, he's going to prepare the way for you. For some of you, it might be a job issue that you're facing. For some of you, it's a family dynamic that's causing a lot of difficulty that you need to address a struggle. For some of you, it's school and education. My oldest grandson is a senior in high school this year and is looking at colleges. You know how hard that is to do in the COVID era? 
can't even go visit the schools. But he's trusting God to lead his steps. Maybe it's just a personal battle that only you know about. Friends, I was talking to the director of our uh, counseling center up at Northway. And he tells me now that there's close to a two-month backlog of people that we can see. And this is with a number of full-time counselors doing virtual sessions in some cases and in a few rare cases face-to-face. Two-month backlog. One-fourth to one-third of all Americans have struggled with some sort of depression during this last year. And yet David says, you know, Lord, I've got issues, but in verse 5 he says this, with your hand of love upon my life, you impart a blessing to me. I just want to say, let's respond that way, knowing that God knows everything, his hand of blessings upon us. And that's just, that causes me in humility to surrender to God and say, thank you. Thank you for that incredible assurance that you bring. For David, omniscience brings comfort. But for many people, the fact that you can't hide anything from God, even the evilness of their own hearts brings them to great concern They want nothing to be out of their control. And I've asked myself in preparing for this, I wonder if that's why so many influential and supposedly smart and very powerful people seem to be subtly but steadily trying to eradicate any mention of God from our national identity or our public discourse. Have you seen that happening in the last season? you can't control God, which they know they can't, but we can control those people, they say with some disdain, who believe in him by canceling anything where his name is mentioned in public. And dare I say it may be coming to schools and possibly even to churches. We've got to take a stand, friends. And I'm thankful for those of you who are doing that, and I'm thankful for pastors like Craig who are willing to call you guys, call us together. We've got to stand and resist those who would reject God. You can't hide, and number two, you can't run. His omnipresence. God is everywhere. The comfort in this is that God is everywhere we go. You can't be stolen from him by some surprise. And he won't ever lose you. Gideon mentioned something in the introduction about missions. And two of the most memorable trips of my life were to India. Because I had never seen, you know, collectively what 1.2 or 3 billion people gathered together in train stations and on highways and giant public outdoor gatherings and so on would be like. There's so many people. And I remember, Lord, how do you, how can you say you know what every one of them is thinking about to say? How can you say that you're, and then I remember. I look up at the stars. Well, I guess, you know, you have a big enough memory in your database to keep it all straight. Now, the concern for people who don't see this as comforting is you can't ever get away from him. So you can't run and hide. You can't escape from him. Jonah tried that. God called him to go to Nineveh. He said, he said no, I'm not going. I'm running. And he gets on a ship to go to Tarshish. And how'd that work out for him? <laughs> right? He ended up in a whale and ultimately surrendered to the will of God. You can't run from him. David uses extremes to explain this idea of omnipresence. He goes and says it this way, verse 8. If I go up to heaven, you're there. If I go down into the realm of the dead, you're there too. I don't have time to explain that, but there's a a really good explanation for that. If I fly with wings into the shining dawn, you're there. 
If I fly into the radiant sunset, you're there waiting. Wherever I go, your hand will guide me and your strength will empower me. It's impossible to disappear from you. Skip on down a little bit. There's no such thing as darkness with you. The night to you is as bright as the day. There's no difference between the two. Why does he say these kinds of things? David uses the uh, illustration of light here a number of times. Why? Why does he talk about sunlight? And why does he talk about darkness and light? And all the... Because light is one of those things, again, that we can measure but not really fully understand. You know what the speed of light is, right? It's 186,282 miles per second. One second, light will go around the Earth seven and a half times. It takes eight minutes for the light from the sun to travel to us. But to give you, again, a little glimpse of the scope of God's greatness, the next visible star in our little part of the world here that we can see, Alpha Centauri, is 4.3 light years away. I don't know what that, how many miles that is. I just, but it takes light 4.3 years. And that means, by the way, this is interesting, that every time you look up into the sky, everything that you see up there is history. It's already happened. You're seeing it eight minutes ago, four years ago, and with you know, the Hubble telescopes and all, who knows how far back they can see. It's astonishing. It's just it's astonishing and, and amazing. God says you can't run from it. So, first six verses, five verses, he's all-knowing, omniscient. The second verses, that would be eight through seven through twelve, he's all present. You could take that negatively. There's no privacy if he's all-knowing. But on the other hand, you could take it really comfortingly. He's always with you. And you could say, well, I can never escape him. But you can also say, I can never run away from you. I can never fall out of where you are. The greatness of God should comfort us all. Knowing that the most amazing, wonderful, limitless being in the universe has reached out to you in love and said this, Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us, that we should be called sons and daughters of God. The final characteristic is omnipotence, verses 13 through 18. God gives us a glimpse into his all-powerful nature, the character of God that can do anything. And it's interesting to me that he doesn't focus in on defeating other you know, negative evil forces or armies or anything we might consider a show of power or force. But on the contradiction, or the opposite side, I should say, of the spectrum, he talks about the smallest thing. He displays his power by saying, but you form my innermost being, shaping my delicate inside and my intricate outside. And wove them all together in my mother's womb. I thank you, God, for making me so mysteriously complex. Everything you do is marvelously breathtaking. It simply amazes me to think about it. How thoroughly you know me, Lord. You even formed every bone in my body when you created me in the secret place, carefully, skillfully shaping me from nothing to something. And that sentence right there is what no man can ever claim to do, to create something from nothing. That's the power of God. You may have heard the little story of you know, one of the famous Silicon Valley AI 
tech giants figured out a way to just develop this amazing intellectual being and cover it with all kinds of synthetic garb and so on. And he basically said, you know, I'm just going to say it. The creation thing's not all that big a deal. It's God and I have God for challenge. So they're out and the Lord shows up and he said, look, I can do this. And he said, okay, well, remember Genesis 2.9, I did this from dirt. He said, well, let's go. And he goes to bend down and the guy says, wait, get your own dirt. <laughs> Why? Because he didn't create from nothing. How many of you saw Apollo 13? Wonderful movie. How three astronauts got saved from potential death, close to death, and they had to create a scrubber to, to scrub the carbon dioxide out of the air because if they didn't do that, they would run out of oxygen before they returned. And the wonderful engineers at NASA and Houston worked through the night to create this little device. And, well, what they had to do was to scavenge different pieces that were in the capsule and compact them into this little box and put them on their back, and it worked. And that's why those three astronauts returned safely. But they started with something. God's power is I don't have to start with anything. I can make whatever I want. No one else can do that. And I find that just so fascinating. One quick sidebar here. These verses are very important to all of us because nowhere else in the Bible is the case against abortion so clearly put forth. Now, I know this is a sensitive topic, and I want to be very clear that when I talk about this, there's a direct connection between our creation as people and God's handiwork. If we, need to, if we can see ourselves as being something God worked together on the inside of us and on the outside of us, how amazing is that? He did the work. And mothers are mightily aware of something happening much, much sooner than the father's. And there's a bond that gets formed, but they know they're not doing anything. It's God doing it. It's God doing it. I'm saying it's God doing it. And I recognize that some of you here, perhaps today, have gone through this experience, and I'm in no way trying to you know, splash any kind of guilt or shame on any of you. Because abortion is not the unpardonable sin. There's forgiveness there. But I also want to say this. If you happen to be in a place where you're talking with a, you know, a pro-choice friend or neighbor, you need to know where to take them to say, well, explain this right here. And they say, well, I don't know if I believe that. And that's where you have the opportunity to say, well, this is what God's word, which has been with us now for thousands of years, has said clearly. And when you choose to support abortion, or if you happen to be counseling a young lady who's struggling with a decision, help them see that they, if they choose to do that, they're clashing swords with God. God is the one that's knitting together, and they're choosing to come in and undo what God himself has been doing. And so I just submit that to you. That's not the point of why this passage is here, I don't believe. But I do believe that it's a very important thing to, to sort of keep in our arsenal of conversation and also as a reminder how to pray for others who are going through difficult times. So let's bring this home. Verse 17 and 18 describe the vastness of God's personal attention. Um, look down there, about on verse 18. Oh God, your desires toward me are more than the grains of sand on every shore. There it is again. This time it's his thoughts toward us. When I awake each morning, you're still with me. God loves us that much, friends. I don't think about it that way. I, I don't. I have to confess to you, I, I just can't 
consciously think about it. But now we know it. It's true. He loves us so much that through Jesus going to the cross and paying the price for our sin, as you heard last week so clearly, Jesus willingly took upon himself the penalty that we were due. It's called propitiation, the payment for all of our sin, past, present, and future. Again, an unimaginable concept. But because Jesus did that, listen, God does not see the sinner. He sees the sacrifice. And that's a hallelujah moment for me because I still find temptation. I still see the devil trying to trip me up. And if you're free from that, then Pastor Craig will have you preach next week. (laughs) While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. How much more now can we be assured of his love because we have his presence and his fullness living inside of us? That's our identity. We are God's own family. His own spirit lives in you and me. And it gives me hope and comfort and promise in this life and our eternal future with him. Yes, Lent is about preparing ourselves to embrace what God did in the cross and the joy of the resurrection. But I also want you to know that all through our days, all the time, God is displaying his greatness. Surrender to him and let his fullness overflow your life. Look up at the stars and just be reminded. On a good night, you'll see 6,000 of them. So it's like one grain of sand worth. He loves you that much. Let's pray. Lord, in ways that I can only imagine, but thank you for, the revelation of these scriptures is just beyond comprehension. And I pray, as Pastor Craig did, that you would examine our hearts and and reveal to us where we need to more embrace your greatness and more celebrate your glory and your omniscience and your omnipresence and your omnipotence. There's no one like you, Lord, and yet you receive us as we are. We celebrate that together and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.